Hello and welcome to Tomorrow. I'm Jade, this is Athena, and we have Mike. Today in news we have... Grande-sized black holes. And even more former Google Lunar X Prize teams have announced their moving forward plans. All of this and more followed by an interview with Jared interviewing Martin Carey, who is the executive director of the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference Astronomy Expo. And then, of course, we get to comments from the last show. I'm Jade, and this is Tomorrow, Orbit 11.21. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Before we get into news, it looks like we have a couple of Escape Velocity citizens we would like to go ahead and give a big thank you to. Um, of course, the Escape Velocity is uh, people who contribute $10 an episode or $30 a month. Every bit helps, and we wouldn't be able to continue making these awesome shows if it weren't for you. And if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now, um, before we head into news, uh, we have a few cool launches that we're going to talk about. Isn't that correct, Mike? That's right. We have quite a few that happened uh, since uh, last week's show. And last week, we only had just a suborbital launch. So uh, yeah. some of the ones that have happened since then have been pretty cool. The first one that we got to talk about is a Chinese launch, uh, which was launching a relay satellite for uh, their future lunar mission, the Chang'e 4 mission. Um, so this launched on Sunday. Let's check it out. This was a launch of a Long March 4C rocket, which launched on Sunday, May 20th at 2128 Coordinated Universal Time from the Zhicheng Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China. The three-stage liquid lock rocket uh, apparently launched the first piece of the Chang'e 4 mission, the relay satellite, which is called QCAO, um, and it is designed by the Chinese Academy of Space Technology, and uh, QCAO is going to be a, well, first off, it's a communications satellite based off of their CAST-100 satellite platform, and the name QCAO is from Chinese folklore, which means magpie bridge, and the name for that was just barely chosen uh, late last month by the uh, Chinese National Space Administration. And the mission was launched a little bit earlier than planned. It was originally targeted for June 2018, and the cause of the reschedule remains unknown since uh, Beijing's pretty uh, tight-lipped about a lot of their launches. However, uh, the uh, communication equipment on QCAL gives the spacecraft four 256 kilobit per second links in X-band between itself and the Chang'e 4 lander and eventually the Chang'e 4 rover. And it's going to provide a link in S-band uh, at two megabits per second between the satellite and Earth. Now, in order to establish a communication link with uh, the yet-to-be-launched uh, lunar lander and rover, China is going to need QCAL because the lander and rover are headed to the far side of the moon, and anything on that side is going to absolutely need to have a relay satellite in order to transmit signals. Now, besides the uh, uh, establishing communications, you might have seen those microsatellites that were deploying out behind the, uh, the spacecraft. And those are going to be taking some very low frequency band um, uh, radio sky images while they're uh, in their mission around the moon. And both of those missions uh, have a, a kind of an interesting nickname, which is Longjiang 1 and Longjiang 2, which means Dragon River. So uh, I'm assuming from some of the radio uh, images that they're going to get from that, not only for uh, a little bit on the surface to calibrate it, but then a little bit more for the sky survey too. So uh, the first piece of this is, is uh, in place now, although it hasn't been confirmed yet whether or not the satellite is on a lunar trajectory. But uh, if everything goes well, and everything goes well with the Long March 5 rocket, China will be launching the rest of the Chang'e 4 mission, the lander and rover, later on this year, hopefully in December. So uh, this was the 15th launch for China overall this year. Wow, good for them. Seems Jeez. like they're making a whole lot of progress. So it's pretty exciting yeah. to see all these uh, really epic updates. And um, so it looks like uh, we have a mission to the ISS as well that uh, yes, recently we do. went up, huh? 
Yes, we do. And this one I actually got to see live in person. Lucky? And it was quite amazing. Although the footage that I got for it uh, still wasn't quite as good as the NASA footage. So uh, I'll, I'll show you the footage that I collected <laughs> for it another time. Uh, but in any case, we're talking about the orbital ATK Antares rocket, which was launching a Cygnus cargo freighter to the International Space Station. And that launched on Monday from Wallops Island. Let's check it out. Five, four, three, two, one. So this launch occurred, as I said, on Monday, May 21st at 844 Coordinated Universal Time from Wallops Island, Virginia. And it was actually the 200th mission for the International Space Station since uh, uh, the first module was launched into orbit back in November of 1998. And the two-stage rocket initially was powered by two Russian-made RD-181 engines for three and a half minutes before the first stage ran out of fuel and separated from the upper stage and payload. And the U.S.-built solid-fueled upper stage, a Castor 30XL, took over after separation, and the automated supply ship separated from the Antares upper stage around nine minutes later into the flight. Um, and then a little bit later, it unfolded uh, two of its uh, solar panels and commenced its three-day pursuit of the space station, kicking off Orbital ATK's ninth resupply run to the International Space Station. Now, this Cygnus cargo spacecraft is named the SSJR Thompson after a former chief chief operating officer at Orbital Sciences who died last year. Uh, a lot of the previous Cygnus missions have been um, uh, named after uh, uh, astronauts who, who had passed away. So a little bit breaking in the tradition, but they still uh, feel very strongly about it. So I, I think that it's really cool that they're, that they're honoring him in that way. But in any case, uh, the breakdown of the cargo on board this mission uh, has about 1,191 kilograms of hardware, a little over 1,000 kilograms of science uh, investigation equipment, around 800 kilograms of crew supplies, 132 kilograms of spacewalk equipment, 100 kilograms of computer resources, and even 13 kilograms of some Russian equipment. And then a few days later, on Thursday, Cygnus was able to rendezvous with and uh, be captured uh, to have its berthing operation at the space station. So there's quite a few other experiments that uh, we want to talk about, one of which is a cold atom laboratory uh, that is happening out of NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But I feel like I'll let Jared explain that when it's, it's actually in installed on the ISS. That's right up his alley. I don't want to steal that there. Well, that's very <laughs> but, generous uh, of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, after a three-day chase, though, uh, Scott Tingle was able to capture the uh, the Cygnus and uh, dock it uh, shortly thereafter. And it's going to be staying at the space station for two months. And then after it uh, uh, is unburst from the space station, there's actually a CubeSat deployer on Cygnus that's going to, to launch six CubeSats for uh, varying experiments uh, at that at time. So very cool to, to see this successful mission. And it was really, really cool to see it in person. Oh, well, I'm certainly jealous. That sounds so like a lot of fun <laughs> and I'm sure your footage is amazing it might not be NASA but it's yours and it's special and I'm sure it's great so that's right yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll see it someday um, and last but, all this. <laughs> last but certainly not least uh, Falcon 9 launched your iridium, iridium 6 and grace fo yeah that's right yeah we had a Falcon 9 launch yeah. this week too that's right yeah, yeah whatever yeah mm -hmm. no well, this is a big deal <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, uh, um, they launched on uh, Tuesday, and both of those missions, for both the Iridium and the Grace follow-on mission, is really exciting. So uh, yeah, let's check out the uh, uh, the footage of this because Seven, this footage is actually six, really pretty too. Five, four, three, two. This rideshare mission, uh, which was arranged between SpaceX, Iridium, and the German Research Center in charge of launching Earth satellites, uh, took off at 1947 Coordinated Universal Time from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And the five commercial communications satellites aboard the rocket are going to add to Iridium's growing next-generation voice and data relay network, uh, bringing uh, the company's upgraded fleet to 55 spacecraft launched since January of 2017. 
2016. The other satellites launched on Tuesday are the follow-ups to the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRACE mission, which used uh, two similar spacecraft to measure the tug of gravity around the Earth from 2002 to 2017. Now, the first stage booster was actually the same vehicle that launched uh, for the first time on January 7th from Cape Canaveral with the mysterious Zuma payload. And Zuma was reportedly lost soon after it reached orbit. Uh, but after uh, 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 investigation, it was all blamed on Northrop Grumman from having a faulty uh, uh, payload separator, payload adapter there. Um, in any case, uh, since this was a previous version, not a Block 5 version, SpaceX did not attempt to land or recover the booster, but it did attempt to catch the payload fairings, which you just saw uh, separate there with their boat, Mr. Steven. Although they did not succeed this time, they did come very close to uh, refining the parachute recovery and the glide system for payload fairings. And that's what they hope to catch it on right there with uh, Mr. Steven. In any case, though, uh, the upper stage engine completed its first firing around 10 minutes after liftoff and released the two 600 kilogram Grace follow on spacecraft. Unfortunately, we did not get to see it. This is happening right now on the footage that you saw there, but we did not get to see it. But those were separated at around 490 kilometers and tilted 89 degrees to the equator. And meanwhile, the Falcon 9 uh, sailed over Antarctica and uh, did a quick little check-in. And they did a brief uh, eight-second burn to raise its altitude to around 600 kilometers and also adjust its inclination a little bit more so that uh, it would be closer to what's being used by the Iridium satellites. Uh, the Iridium spacecraft deployed one by one from the dispenser at the forward end of Falcon 9. And uh, uh, officials declared one hour. Geez, I don't know what uh, what happened just now. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, the Iridium spacecraft deployed one by one, and uh, they declared the mission a success uh, around one hour and 12 minutes after liftoff. And uh, something that I did want to say about the GRACE spacecraft is that the GRACE follow-on missions are uh, pretty unique. Uh, uh, what they're going to be doing this time is that they're going to be measuring the weight of the water that's distributed around the Earth. So oh, cool. uh, that's that's pretty cool for that. That's crazy. That's awesome. It's crazy and you could do that from space. I know, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, what can't you do from space these days? I mean, I, there's obviously a laundry <laughs> list, but that's very neat. And I have to say, I actually had a beautiful dream about Falcon 9 last night. And so I, I'm actually really? very smitten that there's a Falcon 9 launch that was in the news today brought to you by Mike. So thank you for that. Yeah, it was a great dream. <laughs> I was like, you're welcome. Very cool. I was like three feet away from it. So obviously, you know, it was definitely an unrealistic dream, but. A lovely one, nonetheless. During launch? During yes. takeoff? <laughs> yeah, and it was cute. It was like this big, and I'm like, look, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I got good dreams, man. Um, okay, so um, going from launches into news, Athena, I see here you want to talk about some grande black holes. Um, personally, I like my Inventi. Um, or Trenta, but please tell me about these grande black holes. <laughs> yeah, so the reason I call them grande black holes is because, so, so for those of you that speak Spanish, we know that grande means large, but at Starbucks, <laughs> grande is really their medium-sized, and I'm talking about medium-sized black holes. They're also known as Lover. intermediate black holes. And um, up until recently, there was only two categories of black holes, known as stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. But this in-between sized black hole can tell us a lot about galaxy and black hole evolution. In the early universe, there was a lot of dust and gas and rapid star formation. And for some of those stars with shorter lives and much bigger in size, then they would die by collapsing into themselves and they would form a black hole. And these are known as stellar mass black holes. And they're typically around just a few solar masses, meaning the mass of the black hole would be if you combined a handful of our suns together. So about five to about a few dozen of uh, solar masses. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have supermassive black holes, which are millions to billions of solar masses in size. And they're thought to have formed in the early universe. And astronomers have measured that the greater the mass of the black hole, the larger the central bulge is, which, by the way, is this picture right here. Um, you can see where the central bulge is. So through observations, um, it's likely that the supermassive black holes, yep, yeah, this picture right here, you can see where the central bulge is. Um, so through observations, it's likely that the supermassive black holes grew in size through galaxy mergers due to the gravitational interactions when two galaxies begin to merge. And if this is true, then scientists have a lead on how these intermediate black holes may have formed. So researchers analyzed and compared X-ray data of about one million galaxies 
collected by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Chandra, the XMM Newton, and Swift Orbital X-ray Observatories and detected 10 active galactic nuclei, ranging from 30,000 to 316,000 solar masses. So, if stellar mass black holes are around five to a few dozen solar masses and supermassive black holes are millions to billions of solar masses, then these 10 detective active galactic nuclei may be the intermediate black holes that are found in the centers of small dwarf galaxies. By the way, active galactic nuclei is the name for the centers of galaxies, nuclei because it's a center, galactic because it's the center of a galaxy, and active because it's actively emitting light and gobbling up stars and anything that comes into its path, uh, obviously past its event horizon, and black holes gobble them up as they do best. Now, this was discovered, th this wasn't actually discovered until recently because the light coming from these regions are relatively faint. Now, they're super far away, and there's a lot of stars in these regions that can really throw off previous data. Now, scientists are going to be studying a lot more on these black holes to see if they may have evolved from stellar mass black holes into intermediate black holes, and then possibly into supermassive black holes. And then that can tell us quite a lot about the evolution of our universe. And also, if these black holes are set on a collision course for one another, and they happen to merge, gravitational waves will be produced, and scientists will be able to detect this, which is pretty awesome. Now, these studies are going to teach us a lot more about the evolution of galaxies and also, obviously, the evolution of our universe as well. So, yeah, I think that that's it's really cool. I think anything about black holes is really mysterious and interesting. Isn't it? So, yeah, so I think it's awesome that, that intermediate black holes have only been recently studied um, within a few years, but now they really have, like, some strong, strong, solid evidence showing, hey, this actually is, is real, and this is probably in the middle of uh, dwarf galaxies out there. Exactly. Yeah. That's so cool, too, mm. because, I mean, uh, something as elusive as black holes, we're now finding, like, all these, like, diverse intermediaries, like, intermediate yeah. black holes, and you're supermassive, and your little ones, you know, and then even the primordial ones that they were talking about however yep. long ago. So that's actually really, really cool. And hey, yeah. who doesn't like a few uh, gravitational waves, you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We all know someone who gets pretty excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, so it looks like we have some updates from the Google Lunar, Google Lunar X Prize um, teams. Uh, you want to talk about that a little bit, Mike? Yeah, some of the former teams. Um, uh, okay, so some of the former teams, there's four of them, have announced uh, some of their future plans and, and pretty much uh, their intention to keep on moving forward, especially in light of NASA's new commercial needs to start sending cargo to the surface of the moon. Um, so uh, there was presentations at actually a different conference that neither of us are at right now, the Space Tech Expo uh, on May 24th. Four companies that were vying for the $20 million prize that Google Lunar X Prize was putting on um, say that they're really motivated by what they see in the growing interest of, with uh, lunar exploration and commercialization. Those teams include Astrobotic, part-time scientists, Team Indus, and Moon Express. We already knew that Moon Express was going to move forward with some stuff, but I'm excited by uh, uh, these other teams. The, the enthusiasm that's been uh, bolstered by a lot of the shift in national space policy here in the United States, I think, has a lot to do with that. Now, NASA has since unveiled plans for their Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, or CLPS, and the agency is going to be buying payload space on small commercial lunar landers for carrying scientific instruments and other experiments, such as the experiments that have been on the now canceled Lunar Resource Prospector, which I talked about recently. And while Astrobotic has about 12 customers for its first lunar lander mission in 2020, ranging from the Mexican Space Agency to the ARC Mission Foundation, which announced plans on May 15th to fly a copy of Wikipedia on the lander, NASA is not yet a customer for Astrobotic, but that could change soon. Uh, the German company, uh, part-time scientist, is hiring staff uh, in preparation for its first lunar lander mission, which is scheduled to take place in late 2019. Part-time scientists have been working in partnership with a number of major companies outside the space industry, like Audi and uh, uh, Vodafone, and the company is relying heavily on technologies developed elsewhere for the lander. Um, so it's really encouraging to see that they have uh, um, a a lot of support for that and that they're going to move forward and their particular mission is scheduled to uh, go to the Taurus Littrow region of the moon near the Apollo 17 landing site and that mission is the first of several that part-time scientists have planned including one in cooperation with the U European Space Agency later in the 2020s to test the ability to access and use water ice resources at the lunar poles. Uh, 
Uh, so part-time scientists also hope to see their lander take part, of course, in the cargo delivery services for NASA or other agencies as this whole commercial shift is taking place. Now, India's Team Indus is working on a series of lunar lander missions, as well as for sending payloads to the moon inexpensively. Uh, Team Indus is planning an annual series of lunar lander missions starting in mid-2019, and then one mission every year. And the company has completed a set of tests on the qualification module of the lander. And Rahul Narayan, the founder and chief executive of Team Indus, said that they were ready to develop flight hardware for the lander, which... Uh, uh, comes actually as a little bit as, as a surprise since they had a PSLV that was almost reserved for them. I mean, it was essentially reserved that was going to launch at, on, in December of last year. So it's kind of interesting that they're just now uh, starting to develop the actual flight hardware. Uh, but at least their design is ready to move forward. And of course, uh, Moon Express has also pressed ahead with their lunar lander missions and is planning their first mission in 2019. And uh, they still have, the, uh, once uh, when they got their contract in 2015 to do several launches on their Electron rocket, at the Space Tech Expo, they announced that uh, they were not necessarily, they still have that launch contract in place with Electron, but they were open to using a different vehicle on the company's first mission, since Moon Express has several landers that they have planned for varying missions. Electron would not be um, enough for some of the landers, like their MX-9 lander that they have, which would be capable of doing uh, lunar sample return missions, like you see pictured here. And uh, as NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services program is now underway with a request for information that NASA said they re received lots of very positive responses from, a lot of this hope for former uh, Google Lunar X Prize teams is looking very bright, as well as from other companies like Blue Origin, who hope to provide landing capability and take care of all of the human precursor missions that would be needed before humans return to the moon. So I, for one, am very excited by this, and I hope that these teams can uh, not necessarily merge, but collaborate as much as possible, even though they're, they're separated uh, geographically, at least the American teams. But... Who knows, who knows what will happen there? They probably see these themselves as competitors at this point, which isn't a bad thing either. So, Yeah, like motivate anyway, each other. Who's going to get to the moon first? Exactly. Um, again, exactly. second time. Yeah, but I wonder, yeah. like, once ever, like, if everyone starts to get to the moon, like, what's going to then be, be, like, alliance? There has to be an alliance of some sort. Oh, yeah. You know, you would Absolutely. think. But I love that so many people are planning missions to the moon right now. This is so exciting because it's, like, really, really being put into play. So I love that, yeah. yes. Absolutely, and there's been a big um, kind of push, especially in the past, you know, ever since we've been to the moon, like there's always been this interest and kind of romanticism about going back. So it's great that we're actually finally um, making yeah. some real progress with that. So pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's go to the moon. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so uh, speaking of missions, it looks like Rocket Lab has an update to its latest mission. So what's that about, Athena? Yes, Rocket Lab has announced their new launch window for the It's Business Time mission. Um, it's going to be between June 23rd and July 6th at 0.30 to 4.30 Coordinated Universal Time. And it will be launching from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand. Now, the original launch window was from April 20th to May 3rd, but after motor control issues for the Electron launch vehicle during the wet dress rehearsal, it was pushed back. And now, as the issue is being resolved, two more customers were added onto the mission, Irvine 01 and Nabeo, N-A-B-E-O, that is. Irvine 01 is an educational payload from the Irvine CubeSat STEM program. So around oh, 150 nice. members from six different high schools in Irvine, California, joined together in this program to develop the solar-powered CubeSat that will be launching on its It's Business Time mission. There will also be cameras on board the CubeSat to take photos of Venus and other celestial bodies to teach the students how to calculate distances to stars and for them to learn how to direct a satellite. That's like super cool. Um, it's an amazing STEM program to inspire and teach students to pursue a career in the STEM field. And the second customer to be added onto the mission is Nabeo, which is a drag, oh, sorry, drag sail satellite demonstrator designed and built by the High Performance Space Structure Systems, GMBH. Nabeo drag, Nabeo drag sail is a cleanup system 
where its job will be to deorbit inactive small satellites. It'll do this with its ultra-thin membrane, which is going to deploy from the spacecraft when it reaches the end of its orbital lifespan. And then it has reflective panels that will unfold and reach a length of about 2.5 square meters. And this will allow for it to experience a greater atmospheric drag, which will passively deorbit the unused satellites. This will allow for faster deorbiting and will reduce the amount of space junk in lower Earth orbit. Both of these payloads will be joining the other two original customers of the mission, which includes two, uh, two Lemur 2 satellites from the Spire Global and GeoOptics Inc. satellite built by Tyvek Nano Satellite Systems. With the It's Business Time mission being able to add on these two additional customers, it truly goes to show the demand of the small satellite launches. Um, that's really happening today worldwide. And with Rocket Lab being capable of booking a launch for any small satellite customers in the matter of only a few weeks, according to CEO Peter Beck, it really shows the strength of the company and the role in which they play in the rocket industry. And actually, they are the only small orbital launch provider enabling frequent access to orbit. And Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand is the world's only private orbital launch facility. And they're licensed to launch every 72 hours. And they offer the widest range of orbital inclinations of any launch site in the world. So that's like really cool. I actually didn't know that about Rocket Lab. And I've always loved New Zealand, but now to find out about <laughs> Launch Complex One having like the, the widest range of orbital inclinations, like uh, of just <laughs> launches in general, I think that that's, that's so cool. So yeah, that's, that's what's going on with uh, yeah. <laughs> the, its business time mission. I just I love, love the it. title of it oh, too. Oh, I know. The Almost name there. of its mission. It's like really yeah. just getting out of the bed in the morning, like, let's launch a rocket and let's make it record break and let's do some cool stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. Yes, I too. I love how, like, you know, obviously there were some issues with it. And in the time that they were resolving those issues, they gained two more customers for their mission. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh, it goes to show, like, you know, things really do work in the, the way that they're supposed to. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. All is, all is well in uh, the realm of rocketry. Yes. So, Rockets. always good to hear. Rockets. So, um, that just about wraps up news for today. Uh, we are going to take a really quick break. Uh, stay tuned because when we come back, we have an exciting interview that Jared Head will be doing with Martin Carey, the executive director of the RTMC Astronomy Expo. So, go ahead and stay tuned, and we'll see you in just a second. Look into a face that to my name. Hello and welcome back. I'm Jade, and before we get into our main topic, we want to give a huge shout out to our Escape Velocity citizens as well as our Orbital citizens. These people contribute $5 an episode or $15 a month. Every bit helps, and we wouldn't be able to continue making these amazing shows if it weren't for you. So if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. We are now going to throw it over to Jared, who is live at the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference Astronomy Expo, and he's currently hanging out with Executive Director Martin Carey. How you doing over there, Jared? Oh, we are doing fantastic up here in the beautiful mountain air that we have up in Camp Oaks, which is east of Big Bear, if you can imagine, just in the middle of the mountain. So we are really excited today to be bringing you uh, a live remote from the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference. And I have Martin Carey right here, our executive director of RTMC. Martin, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. So uh, just to sort of uh, talk a little bit uh, about RTMC, what is RTMC? RTMC is several things. It started as a group of telescope makers who loved astronomy. And this was back in the 1960s when if you wanted a good telescope, you basically had to build your own or perhaps you could buy one from Japan for a lot of money. So in the United States, the uh, telescope making movement actually began back in the 1920s, back east. So RTMC was um, an event attended to, inter to interest people in astronomy, um, enjoying the sky for themselves, 
and not just um, professionals, it's for ordinary people to have their own equipment, to enjoy the sky, to share it with others, and if they made something, to show it and share it. Excellent. Um, now, up here uh, at RTMC, what are some of the things, uh, the things that actually happen up here at RTMC? Well, we have uh, several things that um, attract our guests. We have, first of all, some outstanding speakers. We have um, speakers from NASA and JPL. We have uh, working scientists from universities. We have uh, interested uh, amateurs who are actually doing some very significant work themselves, um, making discoveries, making measurements, uh, publishing papers. Then amateurs who make things, amateurs who do things. Um, we have uh, people who have discovered comets. We have people who have built, uh, we have up today a, uh, a 36 inch telescope up on the upper field. Um, this uh, um, telescope was, was made in someone's shop. It's got a 36 inch mirror, it was made by uh, the people uh, just from uh, kind of a challenge and a whim. Can we do this? Let's do it. <laughs> um, this is typical of RTMC. It's, it's amateur. Of course, uh, the gentleman, um, Mr. Spooner, who made, made this telescope with his partners, uh, is a very experienced optician. But a lot of the people who, who build these things for RTMC are just regular folk who get interested. Okay. But to answer your question about what we offer, it's, it's speakers, it's science, it's amateurs showing what they've made, it's vendors selling astro goodies, um, and of course it's fresh air under the sky at night. We can actually see the stars up here. When the moon is not full, like nearly full like it is these nights, um, many years you come up here and you can see the Milky Way. You can look at galaxies and meet under the stars. Yeah, and it's really about sharing that experience as an amateur astronomer up here. It is. So what's a, sort of, what is the, the minutia of an experience as an amateur astronomer? Because, you know, we always hear about like professional astronomers and, and they're doing their research and there's these big scientists that are happening out there, but for amateur astronomers, um, what sort of, a, what, do you, what do amateur astronomers do? We look at the sky just for our pleasure. Mm -hmm and we enjoy the sky in many different ways. Really, anybody can be an amateur. There were some scientists working at the Keck Telus Hawaii, and one night they, they had a delay and some kind of a problem working with their equipment. They just decided to step outside, and they looked at this amazing sky overhead in Milky Way and just started talking about it and enjoying it as people. Mm -hmm. That's amateur astronomy. Mm -hmm. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you can enjoy the sky. Um, as a person. That's what it is. You don't have to even own a telescope. You don't have to have any special knowledge that you start somewhere. You start by looking up and enjoying what you see. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, eyes aren't necessarily the only thing that you need in oh, order to get into amateur no. astronomy. There's a multitude of things that you can do with it, right? That's correct. Like you can get uh, binoculars. Yes. So, and those, is that a pretty good way to get started in amateur it's astronomy? An excellent way to get started. I tell people, even my, uh, I have a little eight by 20 monocular. <laughs> That's itty bitty. So. It's tiny, it's about that long. <laughs> and I can point it at the Pleiades, this beautiful cluster that you see in the winter sky. And I can see a lot more stars with my little monocular than my eye can. Mm -hmm. That's amateur astronomy. Yeah. And I, of course I have bigger telescopes, but you don't need fancy equipment. No. Even yeah. just your eye, like the ancient people did, looking up and talking about the stars and telling stories. Mm -hmm. That's astronomy too. Yeah, and it's almost like a continuation of what the ancient peoples were doing. We're 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 bringing the skies to folks and really sharing that with them um, and doing things like that. So. Exactly. You know, you're reading the Greek legends. You know, you, you see in the Bible David talking about the stars. You see uh, people from China and Babylon taking measurements and and writing them down. We're part of that tradition. We love yeah. that. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so we do have a really cool uh, question from Hanis Vorweep from our Twitch chat room, which is asking that if this is considered a part of the maker movement, and also um, sort of a second part of that question, what are some of the most interesting telescopes people have made? So do you guys sort of consider yourselves a part of the maker movement that sort of swelled in the past decade? Well, you're asking me, and I certainly do personally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've had uh, people come to you. you got to go to these maker conferences. They do wonderful things, and they do. Yeah. I love the maker movement. I think it's, it's significant. It's a significant antidote to 
a lot of what people complain about in our technological society. People aren't doing things for themselves as much. Even just putting, modifying a piece of equipment that you have to make it work better for you and personalizing mm -hmm. it. Um, like I gave you the example earlier of uh, Mike Spooner and his team with that 36 inch scope. Yeah. Um, or the spectra heliostat on the upper uh, field. It's, uh, what is it, about 12 feet long and it uh, can image the sun. Um, these are people who make things, they're amateurs, they make big in their garages, in their, the front rooms of their apartments. You know, <laughs> you can grind a mirror in your sink. You yeah, know, if you, you could. Really, if you have to, <laughs> you're crazy, but. <laughs> You have to unclog that sink a little bit. Well, you, you probably so. would. Yeah. A lot of people question our sanity. Nothing, <laughs> nothing new. So, so what are some of the the interesting things, the interesting projects that people bring up here at RTMC? Um, people have made all kinds of uh, odd devices to look through uh, at the sky. Uh, there's a young lady, um, Teresa Cook, uh, a few years ago. She made a, a 3D printed telescope and uh, won a merit award for that. Uh, it worked very well, by the wow. way. You set it up on a table and uh, view the sky with it beautifully. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the spectroheliscope, this guy's been working on it for 11 years in his own machine shop. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, do actual scientific work uh, looking at the sun. People have made uh, telescopes out of bottles and tin cans. Um, I don't know, it, it, the, the imagination is the limit, really. Yeah, and I've, I know that um, one of my favorite telescopes I've ever seen up here is that somebody had literally 10-inch Dobsonians, like the type of telescope um, that we have behind us, but they were there were two of them, and they were looking behind you. Yes. So you would look down into the telescope and look up, and you would get an incredible amount of light gathering, and you would also get like this super cool 3D effect because it was both of your eyes at the same time, and that was that's one of the coolest telescopes I've looked oh, yeah. at up here. And it's, a, it's really, really cool. Um, so to talk, uh, go back to our chat room real quick, Michael Farrell from YouTube is asking, do they get to name any new space body that they discover? And uh, I think uh, you could talk about that a little bit because uh, there's a plaque out there near the telescope field that talks about something related to that. We have a gentleman named Don Mockholz who was here at an RTMC event years ago. And he had, I think it was through his big binoculars he brought. He's a comet hunter, mm -hmm. and he's very good at it. And he has discovered comets himself. He discovered a comet right here at RTMC. <laughs> and uh, he's here this weekend talking about it. Excellent. Yeah. And this weekend, you're talking a lot about comets. Um, because yes. You have a certain special guest up here this weekend. Yes, we do. Yes. David Levy, if you haven't heard of him, you should know about him. <laughs> David Levy is, is one of the best known amateurs in the world. The man has done wonderful work popularizing astronomy, but he's done good science himself. He's discovered comets. He's an amazing observer, a really nice guy to talk to. Um, he's published books, David Levy, L-E-B-Y. Mm -hmm. He's speaking tonight as our keynote speaker. Um, he also has a doctorate. This is very interesting to me. In uh, the literature, I think it's a medieval literature on astronomy, and he is an expert on this. Uh, so he's he's a man of letters, mm -hmm. as well as being an astronomer. So this guy can really uh, tell you some interesting things uh, with the whole historical, cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. But he's talking tonight, and um, he's going to tell about uh, his uh, experiences and work uh, as an amateur slash professional astronomer. Mm -hmm. And uh, to go to our main chat room, Rebel Ace Friesland in it is asking, um, you always see a lot of Dobsonian scopes self-built, uh, but they're not the best way to track and have pre precision, um, but you can, you actually can put tracking motors on them. You things. can. Um, so does that not detract too much for the usage of a Dobsonian? Um, and I personally would say no. It does not. Um, and by the way, this, this telescope behind us is a Dobsonian. Um, they're basically mirrors in a tube on a mount, and then you basically manually move it around. Yes. So, and um, and how do, you, do you feel like Dobsonians are sort of not the best way to go about it, or how, how do you feel about it, since there's always a lot of Dobs up here? I'm very much a Dob man, but mm -hmm. I'm not just a Dob man. I have refractors. I have Maxitovs. I have, you know... I, I think they are very good and very useful. When John, John Dobson, and of course it was all his friends and many other people that were building these things back in the 70s and 80s, 
they make astronomy much more accessible. It makes it that quick and go. And I, I've had members of our club, my old friend Bob, who's, who's passed on now, but he, he was a purist and he said, if it isn't somehow tracking and following the movements of the cosmos, it's, it's just not legitimate. You know? <laughs> he felt very passionate about that. He, always, he, he wanted to write a book called 101 Dead Uses for a Dead Dog. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Hey, I'll write the book, you know. Yeah, but uh, as well. I love Dobbs because they make astronomy accessible. I talked to an, a professional astronomer up here one year who was here at RTMC. And he said, he says, I work at a professional observatory during research, but I like to use my Dobbs because everything gets out of the way when I'm looking at the sky. And I don't have to think about the instrument very much at all. Yep. And he liked that. It, it, it truly becomes you and the instrument and the universe. Exactly. And that's, that's an incredible connection, especially to feel that when you're exactly. actually working with your telescope. Um, yeah. And Andy Zwarbrick from our Twitch channel is asking, does your group also contain astrophotographers? And I mm -hmm. guess we should just say yes. Um, I do astrophotography. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot. In fact, there were people last night um, doing astrophotography of moon um, because the moon is nearly full this weekend. So that's, it's very difficult to do deep sky stuff without the moon. Right. Um, but there are also a couple of people taking images of planets. So, um, and you guys actually have an entire astrophotography competition up here too. We do. This year, I was just talking to Charles, who's uh, running the astrophotography competition. He was showing me that the, uh, the entries this year were particularly good, mm -hmm. especially because of the eclipse that we had in August. Yeah. So it's impressive. There was, there's more and more people who know how to take good astrophotos. Mm -hmm. the, the quality of, of, the, of the hobby is rising. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting really good, especially as technology helps oh, yeah. move things forward, too. Um, I know I'm at the, it's almost at the point where you can run things in real time on your laptop oh, yeah. and, and actually work with it. We actually saw a gentleman out there uh, last night who had a huge telescope that he made himself. Right. And he's got all those Arduino and Raspberry Pis to yeah. <laughs> run his imaging and movement system on it. He's so, a real techie, yeah. So it's not just necessarily something for, you know, sort of like stuffy mathematicians um, no. nowadays. There's actually no. a lot of technology involved in it. Like off the shelf, you know, pick it up as you go. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they're making it easier. I mean, you can take a decent picture of the moon with your cell phone mm -hmm. with a very inexpensive telescope. It, it, and we were doing it last night and showing people how to do it on the field. Yeah. So uh, you don't have to have anything fancy. Yeah. But if you do, of course, you can take magnificent photos. Yeah. Um, so with these, uh, with these astronomy conferences, what, do, what, what really is the benefit of having a conference like RTMC? I think the, the biggest benefit is bringing people together of like mind, a like passion and interest, sharing ideas, um, validating each other's craziness, I think. Is it, it, you might say I'm a psychologist, so I can say that. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful kind of madness that overtakes us under the sky. We get together, we can share ideas, equipments, passions, favorite places to observe, experiences making things, and encouraging each other in new projects. And uh, for folks who are interested in sort of getting into amateur astronomy, um, what would you suggest to them? What, what would be some of your, your advice, um, especially with all of these, these choices of the technology nowadays that we have coming out? Well, sort of what would, you, what would you say to folks that are interested in becoming an amateur astronomer? Best thing to do, I advise people, is join up with an astronomy club okay. and be with other people who share your interests and who can uh, mentor you, train you, show you things, get out under the sky. Um, it's, there's a lot of wonderful things on the computer and we encourage that find the great websites um, You know cloudy nights forums and things like that. There's a lot of good resources But there's nothing to replace getting out under the sky mm -hmm. and especially with other people who share your passion for it Yeah, it's it's fantastic to do that um, Sort of to go back to our chat room uh, from twitch honey's war has another really great question Which is do amateurs ever work in coordination? with the astronomers, like looking to see if anyone observed a phenomenon that they do not have enough data on. So are amateurs uh, sort of at the level where they can work with the, with the professional astronomers now? There are some who definitely are. They're, mm -hmm. they're working in conjunction with, am with amateurs and professionals together. There are organizations that support that. Um, I know the Riverside Club has a number of their members that do actual research, for instance, um, 
occultations of stars, measuring uh, star light levels to um, uh, look at planets. <coughs> Excuse me. Just as an example, uh, there's a lot of things that amateurs can do. Um, even, uh, for instance, I just talked to a gentleman from the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, and um, they work with amateurs too and professionals to take regular systematic observations of the planets, Jupiter, Mars, and other planets, uh, because there's not professional observatories or, or spacecraft always looking at those planets to see mm -hmm. everything that happens on them. Sometimes amateurs can see things that happen that no one else will see. Mm -hmm. And that can be coordinated with professionals. Yeah, and I know at the uh, Jet Propulsion mm -hmm. Laboratory in Pasadena, they actually are asking the amateurs to take images of Jupiter um, when Juno goes past during its close passes, so that way they can have very wide, you know, full disk images of Jupiter for context for those Juno cam photos. Um, and I know a couple of people that have actually, you know, participated in that program. Um, so us amateurs, we actually we're at a level now where even the professionals, even people, you know, like high end planetary science professionals are starting to, to recognize them. I think that's ability to do that that's exciting yeah so up here um <laughs> up here at rtmc um with everything that we've got around it uh, what is what is sort of the best thing about rtmc up here best thing about rtmc is uh being able to meet under the sky with with, with these elements that we bring to it the speakers the actual sky um and people i know it's important amateurs who love the goodies they like the vendors mm -hmm. <laughs> and being able to get together and compare ideas, to observe together, to look at equipment. Okay. I think it, you put those elements together and you create what, what has made RTMC Expo an attraction. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if people are like super interested in RTMC, what's a great way to approach that? Go on our website mm -hmm. and uh, RTMC uh, and you will see that uh, we have tried to make the website more inviting, a little yes. less uh, nerdy and, and uh, obscure. And uh, you'll see that uh, that uh, you can uh, see the kinds of things that we've done, the kinds of things that our camp does, the, the activities. Um, we're already talking about 2019. And um, we're looking at, uh, instead of Memorial Day weekend, we're looking at uh, September of 2019. Stay tuned, go to the website and uh, you will be able to keep track of our activities. And uh, just uh, some more interesting questions from our chat room here, uh, which is asking Rebel Ace Friesland, asking, uh, do you educate science and technology to the general public? And in what way do you do that? So are you guys, I mean, public's allowed to come to RTMC, right? Oh, we want the public. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we are the public. It's, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's not like we're some uh, ivory tower uh, far off, organization that's, that's separate the people that come to rtmc uh, they're they're beginners there's they're middle level people there there's uh, all the way up to professional mm -hmm. and we promote the science of astronomy there's there's lectures going over here right behind us in the wall uh, all day long of, of professional and amateur astronomers talking about their craft their interest their science their area of research um we have uh jpl nasa uh, mark raymond talking to us Sunday night about the Dawn Project. Oh, excellent. Spacecraft uh, that, that's flying in close to these asteroids. That, that's exciting. This guy really knows his stuff. Uh, come on up. Uh, talk about promoting and outreaching the science. We've got it, and we do it. Excellent. A um, couple more questions from our chat room. We're going to kind of combine two people asking the same question, uh, which is Stratty asking, any amateur non-optical telescopes being built? And also Green Gym 2 asking, is it all optical telescopes or do some build radio telescopes too? They certainly do build radio telescopes. Mm -hmm. It's something we see here at RTMC occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some very knowledgeable people who have worked in all sorts of uh, uh, wavelengths. It's, you know, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping, and, and I'm glad you asked the question, makes me think, to put out the invitation. Hey, you guys out there that are setting up your uh, personal radio observatories for your backyard, bring it on up, you know? Yeah. Um, some of them are actually are portable, and they actually do research with them. Oh, that is so cool that they're able to do that. Hope somebody's listening. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Get the word listen. out, because I know they're there. Yeah. Uh, also going to 
Kay, uh, Kay McCoy in our chat room, which is asking any nationwide or international organizations for people to look to for local stuff, because um, we do have an audience that's not only just in the United States, but also around the world as well. So any organizations you can think of right off of the top of your head? So for me, I think Night Sky Network is one of those. Uh, that's, that would be that's my first. Able to do that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Night Sky Network, I would go to first. Yeah. And they are, they are a fantastic group of people uh, if you're super interested in that kind of uh, amateur astronomy uh, with that going then. So very, very cool. Well, Martin, thanks for coming on to talk with us. And we've got one more person to talk to, I believe. Travis, come on up. We're going to talk to you a little bit, uh, sort of just about some, some cool stories um, and stuff. So, uh, and in the meantime, I'll go ahead and answer this question from Rebel Ace Friesland, which is asking, at what latitude are you? Aren't nights too short now? Um, yeah, I think we're at 34, 34 north, um, and it is summertime, so our nights are a little, uh, a little short here. Um, so, <laughs> but you know, it's what we, it's what we contend with um, as we are astronomers. So, Travis, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, good Great to, to have you here. And, uh, our tomorrow viewers are, are definitely interested to hear some of the stories that you have. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all. Okay. Uh, I'm the, as far as RTMC, I am the son of the founder of RTMC, which is Riverside Telescope Makers Conference, which started in 1968. But uh, the connection to everybody goes, how did your dad get into astronomy? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, well, in 1963, Christmas, I asked for a telescope, and he gave me a three and a quarter inch telescope at that time, and then he said, I then I never saw it again because he took it and started observing, and then said it was too small, <laughs> and then he had said, uh, I have to build something bigger, and, he didn't want to go to the retailers, the giants of the day, because you bought a four and a quarter inch reflector telescope for a thousand dollars, which when a house costs thirteen thousand dollars in nineteen sixty five, that's some big money. That's big money. <laughs> so he he uh, there's some people who may know of uh, Warren Estes. He was the astronomy teacher at the uh, Riverside Community College. He was part of the Riverside Astro Astronomical Society. And he and a couple other folks uh, joined together and helped my dad build a Redwood Base 8-inch telescope with galvanized pipe joints for setting the uh, altezimuth Altazmuth uh, connection. So, and then uh, the only thing he didn't make physically himself was uh, the mirror. He got that. He said, "It's beyond me and anybody else's scope." So he he in about 1965 finished this product project and then started taking it around to schools, including mine was the guinea pig. Uh, <laughs> sixth grade, have your dad come to class and uh, and uh, uh, talk about his telescope about and have, having actually done uh, elementary uh, astrophotography mm -hmm. um, back in the day when 35 millimeter was king. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah those, were, uh, those were definitely uh, definitely the days of that time. So. Yes, and, I, I, <laughs> and I, I was thinking about all this last night and I says, you know why the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference came to fruition is because his first official project was building that telescope. And so he was such a promoter. He liked to call himself a promoter of astronomy. He's kind of an evangelist of it. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was going to, uh, he, he, oh, I'm losing track. But uh, so he loved to share everything he learned. Mm -hmm. In other words, when he took and presented his pictures, he said, you guys can do this too. Yeah, you know, and he basically took that point of view uh, all throughout his uh, career. He sold, he was a Twinkie salesman to pay the bills mm -hmm. full time, but a full time amateur astronomer made it his extracurricular life. People uh, are really surprised he ended up being for the last five years of his life, the full time uh, astronomer astronomy uh, professor at Riverside City College, replacing Bob Dixon at the time then. 
uh, but he had uh, he didn't have the formal education of a physicist. He just had his total love and learning from that love. Mm -hmm. So um, I was listening to Martin, and the synergy is what this place brings mm -hmm. to folks because observing is a I, is uh, in a telescope situation. It's an isolated. You're out in the middle of nowhere. You're usually with your own telescope on your own time. And if you bring your spouse or significant other, that's 95% of the time during the year, it's by yourself. You're a researcher. Uh, but RTMC was, uh, brought us energy to the folks who are usually by themselves, you know, and brings them together and just get all these ideas I mean, Dobsonian was great uh, in the day because he was at the first Riverside Telescope Makers Conference. And, uh, you know, I was, he was just the other, he was at the other, other end of the state and he was promoting astronomy just like my father was and, and it made a great merger of powers. Yeah, fantastic. So it sounds like uh, uh, amateur astronomy really had a, a, quite a profound effect on you and also a lot of the people who are here. Every vacation was a astronomy event. We would, <laughs> we would be hiking anywhere, and Dad would know something about this, 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 where the sun was and the planets, and we could see Venus. And I think one time I remember this story. We were up at Mount Rainier uh, and saw Jupiter in the middle of the day. Oh, okay. In the middle of the day. I mean, this gotcha. is like we're, we're, we're up at about halfway up the Rainier Mountain, mm -hmm. and he says, oh, I think... Jupiter's going to be like four hands from the sun, and we all saw it. Yeah, <laughs> and this was before computers. This well, was right? this was like late sixties. Okay, so before yeah. any any electronic <laughs> uh, uh, thing. And I was thinking about your question about amateur astronomy. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's two forces since the day that electricity was made general in our country, mm -hmm. you have lights everywhere. Mm -hmm. Then yes. you have light pollution. Yes. And, so. <laughs> but before Tesla, our famous car maker, excuse me, that's a joke, Morning. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, he's the, the, the father of the, the name of the state. But uh, uh, the, the light pollution was not there pre-1900. Mm -hmm. So everybody could actually be an observer. Yeah. And most of the Greek uh, and uh, ba Babylonian empires created the constellation names that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Greeks just put them, and the Romans put them into Latin, Latin names. But uh, it was, you know, everybody could be, still be, an astronomer, the tools are are there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's kind of amazing. You know, like in the sixties, they uh, were part of Apollo. Mm -hmm. They really were yeah. because what they did is one of the projects that uh, RAS Riverside Astro Astronomical Society was part of was a mile long cable which measured occultations of the moon mm -hmm. by stars because radar could not penetrate. The, and give any definition to the moon uh, features, mm -hmm. but you could see it around the edge if a star passed by it. But if you had a, had a, had a line of a mile uh, long and put uh, 10 stations, mm -hmm. beeps, yeah. beeper, um, they would uh, be able to determine the topography of the moon because radars and, and there was no sonic that could reach there, you know, sonar. Yeah. So, that gave them the ability to figure out where they were going to land wow. the Apollo. Yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. I didn't realize that that was a uh, help from the amateurs to make that happen. Yeah, so. I did, and and oh, it was cool. uh, it was a, a college professor who was working for NASA, mm -hmm. and that helped them get the preliminary work for where how they were going to figure out where they could land. Mm -hmm. And to kind of talk a little bit about light pollution. Um, oh, okay. As well, um, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, we, we really are losing the sky all over the world. Yes, um, that was one and, of the subjects earlier today. Yeah, and, um, and uh, that, really that ability to see the sky is, is often life-changing for people 
who have lived in a in a very light polluted sky right. for quite a long time, and then all of a sudden go out to somewhere in the very dark skies and they see the Milky Way for the first time, and they're just absolutely blown away. And, and for a lot of people, it's very profound. I know for me, uh, when I did that uh, about ten years ago, it was pretty profound for me. Um, so it's to kind of help combat light pollution. What are some of the what are some of the things that can help with that? I mean, that's a that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, Support your national parks, mm -hmm. never because they are uh, large swaths of land mm -hmm. and national monuments and and state parks. Uh, they are trying to keep areas natural, mm -hmm. and so part of the light pollution is that it's metropolitan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but. Other than being politically active, uh, you know, stopping it from from growing, it's a constant challenge because I love it when you go out to even like places. Palm Springs is a city, but you can just get outside of that area to the northeast, and you know, you get a mountain between you and and the t the city. You've got a good chance, but most of the uh, larger metropolitan areas, it's kind of lost. Uh, my dad had funny little jokes or funny little sayings <laughs> when, uh, when we were out in star parties because south of Riverside was undeveloped. Oh, yeah. Okay. Back in that time, yeah. Was... But there would be either fog or smog, <laughs> and, and we would have, and we were just above it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And so the, the, light, the light was dimmed because yeah. there was a layer of fog uh, uh, covering the city or smog but yeah. we, we don't smog one smog but, <laughs> but back in the 60s it was like oh wow we can observe mm -hmm. out here just 15 miles away and be fairly dark yeah uh, uh, but i'm sure there's lots of projects i i was i was hearing for the first time a lot of projects that are working uh, around like pollution you mm -hmm. know bureau land management and stuff like that but i don't know anything personally but it's important that makes some of the uh, NASA projects more important mm -hmm. because they're actually above the atmosphere anyway. Yeah. And so there's huge value to the professional uh, projects, Hubble and et cetera. Uh, but that doesn't solve the light pollution issue, but it's a great uh, surrogate because the detail is just, even if you had no light pollution, you have other things in the atmosphere that, that uh, obscure mm -hmm. images so when you get outside the atmosphere so uh, promoting those types of projects are, yeah. are amazing yeah and to kind of go into our chat room um a question from astro yyz to kind of sort of paraphrase it um with it which is that what are astronomy clubs doing to attract more people that are not necessarily known for being involved in astronomy sort of like a more diverse crowd kind of thing is that is that sort of something that looks very important to making sure that amateur astronomy can, can stay popular in the future? I think there's geographical dispersion of people uh, who are in it, because there's like, there's people who aren't here that I know that are, that are uh, involved in it. Uh, a guy in Huntington Beach is doing kind of a sidewalk uh, mm -hmm. approach, uh, personal acquaintance of mine. Uh, websites, uh, Griffith Planetarium has mm -hmm. uh, a great director. He was a friend of my father's, and they would get together. Well, I can't remember his name. Uh, Dr. Uh, Krups. Yeah, Dr. Krups. Yeah, Dr. Krups. So oh, okay. Actually working okay. There, so, yeah. But uh, <laughs> when he goes on KABC with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Doug, uh, Doug McIntyre and talks informally about what's going on, uh, follow up on those types of things that you hear. If you hear it on the radio, there's a website. There's a planetary uh, uh, society out of Pasadena. Uh, Mount Wilson is always involved. There's there's websites you look up. You you Google uh, amateur astronomy uh, uh, in my town mm -hmm. uh, or amateur astronomer, depending. Uh, but it's really a grassroots uh, type event. Mm -hmm. I mean, or movement uh, that grows slowly. It takes a love of nature. It takes a love of, of, of sharing that with others, you know, 
And that was the thing about uh, uh, Clifford Holmes was that he, that was it. I mean, he, he was taking, he was going and experiencing it or taking people with him. Um, you know, when he passed away in 1993, uh, there were 500 folks at his memorial who were, most of them were from his astronomy class in. So find out where the nearest astronomy club uh, class or club is in your local uh, college mm -hmm. or science teacher. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it can start all the way from that, uh, but uh, there's all kinds of resources. It's interest, it's enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the future of, of amateur astronomy is is sort of up to us, uh, and it's, it's really our effort that we have to put in right. um, to make sure that the future of it is what we want to see. Well, it's like it. anything so, else. Yeah. You have to pass it along to the next generation, mm -hmm. and you do that by involving the younger generation. Yeah, exactly. You know, get, bringing the kids with you to astronomy, they, mm -hmm. they might get bored to death, but I think they'll pick it up because they'll say these <laughs> people over time, they'll figure out that there's enthusiasm uh, and expertise and uh, longevity. I mean, there's people I know, I know here who are incredibly enthused, mm -hmm. uh, have, have for years. Uh, uh, Ashley McDermott uh, was with my dad for, for many years, running all these activities. And it was just pretty amazing uh, how these people stick through it. And, uh, you know, as long as there are a significant others brought along too, that actually makes it a little stronger. You yeah. can convince them. Be cool. All right, so, Travis, thank you so much for coming you. on today. Thanks we really appreciate listening. it. And we also want to thank uh, the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference for being so nice enough to host us uh, out here today and get us internet literally in the middle of nowhere. So we're going to take a quick break on tomorrow. And when we come back, your comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow right after this. Science, it both draws us together and tears us apart, brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. Hello and welcome back. Um, before we get into the comments from last week's show, we want to give another huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens, as well as our Orbital citizens, and of course our suborbital citizens. These folks contribute $2.50 an episode or $5 a month. Every bit helps, and we wouldn't be able to continue making these wonderful shows if it wasn't for you. If you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, and I am, of course, joined by Carrie Ann and Ben, mom and dad. Mom and dad. Uh, the parents are back in town, so uh, no more. You guys didn't throw any parties, did you? Of course not. We don't have <laughs> friends. We don't throw parties. Um, so we're going to go ahead and delve into the tasty comments from last week's the show. Tasty comments. Delicious. Um, and of course, uh, uh, last week's show, we got to interview Troy McCann from Moonshot Space. Quite a fascinating young man he was. Um, and that, of course, was Orbit 11.20. So if you'd like to check that out, I'm pretty sure it's going to be somewhere near me in this video cube <laughs> on whatever website you're on. Um, so definitely check that out. So the first comment we're going to go ahead and dive into is uh, from YouTube, from user Streetwind. Um, and they said, the best part about a Chinese commercial launch provider? Proper launch broadcast. Big smiley face. Well, I mean, maybe, <laughs> hopefully. That In is, theory, yeah. yeah. In yeah. theory, yeah. exactly. That is one of our gripes with uh, the Chinese broadcasts is that... <laughs> Wait, yeah. it's, it's assuming there's a broadcast at all, really. Exactly, that's exactly so it. So assuming yeah. that there's a broadcast at all, usually there isn't. Uh, sometimes there's, like, really super scary, dangerous footage of somebody <laughs> so who's, like, like... Way too close way to this too rocket. Way too close, like, entirely <laughs> this too close. hypergolic rocket, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> there's that. Or uh, if there, even if there is a broadcast, it's sort of like, hey, by the way, we did a thing last week. Uh, <laughs> and, and, like, that's it. It's really, like, it's sketchy at best. Yeah. yeah. 
China, well, Blue Origin, not sure which one. Ouch. <laughs> ouch. Uh, to, be, hang on, ouch. to be fair, to be fair, they have Blue Origin has been broadcasting their stuff. I'm just yeah, they've, I'm just poking, they've been getting I'm much better. I'm poking fun. I'm poking fun. Yeah, no joke. Uh, but seriously, <laughs> but really, wow, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, exactly. It, in theory, they could have some really amazing, uh, amazing uh, broadcasts. Amazing. No, That's wow. the shirt for the show. So uh, Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Just gonna stop talking. This is why I don't do this anymore. <laughs> All right. All right, next one. So, uh, also from YouTube, from Pony Bottle, nice. uh, they said... Is that a pony in a bottle? How does that work? Is no, that it's like a, a bottle ship for a bottle? pony. Or a bottle um, for a I pony? Really, I thought it was a pony shaped like a bottle. Or Ooh, a bottle that's another... shaped like a pony? Or a bottle shaped like a pony. We had too many, too many Boom. options. All of them, whichever you decide. Humanoid robots were also chosen due to the need to be able to use tools that could also be used by humans, i.e. one toolkit fits all. Um, so that's an interesting comment. So we were actually talking about why um, Robonaut, Robonaut yep. uh, was somewhat of a humanoid shape and why it kind of resembled a person. And, uh, we discussed the functionality of that last week. We discussed maybe there's some sort of um, more sentimental value, like, hey, it looks like you, you know, be into space. Um, I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't actually I didn't even, think of this I hadn't either. thought at all about, you know, oh, making it so that it can use a wrench. But, yeah. I mean, at the same time, you don't necessarily need it to have a head like that, though, right? I mean. Well, I remember last week they brought up the fact that I guess the head um, had two cameras that are supposed to simulate, um, you know, the way a human would see depth with, perception. Per, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it still doesn't face. need to be right there, right? No, it could be. No, no, could, no. But just humanoid in general, it very well could have looked like a weird octopus looking thing. It, it very yeah, well could have. That's exactly what one of the uh, comments was last week. Why yeah. don't you make it look like an octopus? Right. Well, like, well. have multiple arms to be able to do multiple things at once. Once because at, that know. would be creepy. Imagine, would you like to be on a, answer, on a commercial <laughs> space station with this answer. octopus so robot the be like, the way it goes. like, hey guys, you know, it could be super hyper functional and it could Heck do all yeah. these things and like one arm could be a screwdriver and one arm could be space a wrench tentacles. and one arm, it would be totally great. And everyone went, no, that'd be creepy. That's no, a different no, no, show. We're, <laughs> no, that, that'd just be creepy. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and make it look like a human, and that's Astro cool. Astro Cthulhu. Like we already have like space wrenches that we can 3D print in space anyway, so it's cool. We'll just give it a hand, and then we'll give it a face, and we'll call it Robonaut. How <laughs> cool is that? Like that's not the thought process that goes into that for sure. All right, that's fair. I mean, yeah, I just. It is practical though when you think about it th in that. I don't. In uh, that way. I don't think I want to be. If there's a space octopus robot, I don't think I want to be on the same ship as the space octopus robot. I think it'd be terrifying. Okay. <laughs> well, we just all learned something about Ben today. He has a thing for. It's fantastic. He has a thing against uh, uh, many. Asking armed creatures. what we're talking about, we're talking about Robonaut. <laughs> why it's a humanoid shape uh, versus an octopus that's shape, exactly, or any shape. critter. Right. To be I mean, honest. it could be a box, right? There's just a box with like a, little a arms. A box that... is super functional. Absolutely. Uh, Let's just put cubes in space. Oh, weird. No <laughs> one's ever thought of that before. <laughs> I'm in. Next. All right. YouTube. <laughs> Kevin F, uh, he states, hi guys, hi. how large would a low earth orbit space station would have to be, hmm, how large would a low earth orbit space station have to be to make out its outline with your naked eyes from the surface of earth? Awesome show. <laughs> so I think the trick, so I originally was gonna be like, size doesn't matter, it's how reflective it is, and then uh, no, Carrie Ann no, 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 pointed no. out that's not what he's asking. Right, because this, so this comment came off of YouTube, right? And uh, somebody else uh, had responded and said something along those lines. I'm like, well, you can see the International Space Station with your naked eye, mm -hmm. it's not a big deal. And then uh, Kevin actually followed up and said, no, no, I understand that, but how big would it have to be so it doesn't look just like a shooting star? Mm -hmm. For so, like discernible details? I, shape? Yeah, I, I think so, right? Because uh, you, know, you use a telescope and you get those really cool shots of like in ISS, uh, uh, what is it? Transit. Thank you. Transiting yeah. uh, like the moon or the sun and or anything along those lines. Yeah, and you can see the solar panels. Yeah, panels. Exactly. That yeah. looks really, super really neato. cool. Yeah. That's, yep, that's, super neat. That, that, that's that, what NASA says it looks like. That's a technical question. <laughs> Hashtag uh, super neat. <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally, uh, that's totally technical. So I, I think that's that's where this question is coming from. That's, that's the initial intent is how large would it have to be to look like 
to be able to, to discern that with your naked eye, no, no need for a telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I have no no idea. Probably a good question for Jared. It's also assuming low Earth orbit, which is in in the text, right? So that, uh -huh. that kind of dictates where it's going to be. Because technically I mean, speaking, you could orbit the Earth like a foot above the Earth. The surface right, like the airplanes Earth. technically are in a sure, low Earth orbit right, except to a certain extent. Kind of, yeah, they don't really, yeah, it's just that, you know, maintaining that the necessary velocity through atmosphere is right. not a thing. Right. So, <laughs> at least not with current technology. Uh, is that a true statement? Yeah, that's a true statement. True, true enough statement. Uh, so, um, uh, I don't know, it'd have to be a lot larger. <laughs> I think that's a Jericho. You have any idea? I, I mean, mean, it'd have to I, be huge. I cheated, I did a little research. Apparently, someone has asked a similar question uh, somewhere on this thing called the internet, and what I was able to dig out from a response is any spacecraft features must be at least 100 meters or so large for them to be discernible by the naked eye, but at a distance of 400 kilometers. Uh. Um, and they use, of course, the ISS as comparison. Uh, it measures 109 meters truss length by 73 meters, solar array length, yeah. and not normal nominally orbits at 418 to 423 kilometers altitude. But the problem um, is that you can't, with your naked eye, you can't make out any of those features. It just looks like a dot. Right. Goes, exactly. So, so it's got to be a lot. I get that. Based on that, it's got to be a lot larger than that. Because, yeah. Yeah. We'll have to get back to it. <laughs> right. I, yeah. And I, I think. Big. I think really, like, really, really big. big. Independence really big. Day. Yeah. That this was This is our Independence Day! <laughs> <laughs> Ew. All right, okay, so. Really quickly, yeah. uh, so there is somebody in our Twitch chat room that's asking how to ask a question. Oh. Go ahead, exactly as somebody else uh, mentioned, feel free to write it into the Twitch chat room. We'll be able to see it there. Uh, magic. So yeah, and be able to push it to air, so go ahead and do that. Um, oh, wait, there it is. Uh, it says, how come the International Space Station doesn't just float away into space, and if it did happen, what would we do? Hashtag question, which you don't actually need to hashtag that, but I appreciate that nonetheless. That's, that's the shirt for the show. <laughs> Hashtag question. <laughs> I think I feel like that's that's the shirt for every show uh, is hashtag question. So I mean, the simple explanation is we're you know we're on the sphere, the globe of the Earth, and it, in orbit, you know, a lot of people get confused. They think that you're going up, but you're actually going sideways really fast, and mm -hmm. you're falling around the Earth. You're just constantly falling. Think of it like uh, if you were to take a baseball and throw it, it kind of goes in an arc, but it only goes so far. If you were to take that same baseball and throw it harder, it's gonna go further, and if you were to take it and throw it you know, hard enough, it's just gonna never stop, and it's gonna go all the, all the way around the planet. But gravity is still always pushing down on that. Uh, so, uh, or pulling pulling, down. pulling, pulling, how down you wanna say that. So towards it's, Earth. So you're, you're trying to, uh, if you're slower than uh, orbital speeds, you're gonna you're gonna essentially fall back in. If you're faster than orbital speeds, you're gonna sling you would slingshot out. But at just the right speed, you're gonna basically sit there and just fall around the planet all the time. I think uh, decent enough explanation. Yeah, as yeah. Dennis says, right. the International Space Station is constantly falling toward the center of the Earth, but has enough horizontal velocity, or is going fast enough, to miss hitting the Earth. If that uh, if that helps at all. Yeah, you're as Jared says. Hi, hi, Jared. Hi, if Jared. You're watching from. You're falling, but constantly missing the ground. Right. Is, is essentially. Is what's the other way to look at it. Now. Absolutely. How poetic. Absolutely. There you go. All right. So go ahead. Sorry, right. not to cut you Onwards, off. Onwards. A comment oh, from. I'm sorry. From Vax Headroom. Yes, Ben. Gravity sucks. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks, Vax. There it is. Good. Um, so this comment is from Facebook from Curtis Kurt, Curtis Curtis Nash. That would be a great job creator to go ahead and put up GPS satellites around Mars. Hmm. Martian I mean, telecommunications. It will be in the future, but we can't really get there today. Not today. I mean, human. <laughs> I yeah, human. exactly. Human. Humans can. But uh, but the rovers on Mars do talk to one of the satellites. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, which is, is not GPS exactly, but it, it it's still a, a variation of a satellite talking to. Uh, something that is positioned on the ground of Mars. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, uh, and would it still be considered GPS, Global Positioning uh, System Satellite? MPS, Mars Positioning System. MPS. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose. But it'd be you can EPS. still technically say it's global, global on a different. It's a globe. Planet, it's just a different yeah. globe. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like Earth. It's not like it, when it, we call we'll our to, what a, star the Sun. Right, right, right. You know, what a great problem this can be, where we're gonna have to differentiate between the Earth Global Positioning System and the Mars, Mars. Global Positioning System. So GPS system. and MGPS. 
Yeah, it's going to be eGPS and sure. mGPS, I think. Yeah. Sure. There we go. Or 3GPS and 4GPS. Aha! See what you did there. I get it. Because uh -huh. of the plane uh -huh. rock from and the, the sun. Uh -huh. yep. Boom! That's, wow. Boom! That's yeah, a more good acronyms. One. Exactly. It's not like we need that. fire with the great mm. words. Uh, yeah, I mean, eventually, I think we will need some sort of GPS. But I think before we go to GPS on Mars, we're going to need some sort of better communication system. As you mentioned, there are um, currently satellites orbiting Mars that uh, kind of act as a as a leg, it basically takes the transmissions and repeats them back over to Earth. Uh, that's that's the hand movement that goes with that, in case you were wondering. Okay. Right, because it goes from the so rover or the lander controller. up to the space satellite traffic controller, that's over. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so, um, uh, you know, legs over the, the signal. But sure. we're going to need a lot more. We're going to need, uh, much like what many companies are working to build here, kind of a global internet constellation, we're going to want likely the same thing on Mars. Mm -hmm. And we're going to want to have those constellations that talk to each other as well. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me before we have some sort of um, GPS system on Mars sure. itself because we just we can't get humans there. So, but someday, right, right, right. someday, yeah. someday, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, All absolutely. Right? You, yay. So uh, next comment we have from YouTube. This is from Red Dwarf LV. Four. Four. Red Dwarf. <laughs> oh, well, I'm educated, ah. aren't I? <laughs> oh, goodness. Aren't SRBs notoriously hard to reuse economically? SRBs being uh, solid rocket. Solid rocket. Thank, Thank you. Thank uh, you. You want me I to was getting that? there Who just for some reason that word wasn't coming to me, and so it wasn't actually a question in so much as I was hesitating to uh, to speak. Go ahead. I mean, we had solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle program on the two sides. They were the things on the sides. Yep. Hence the two sides. <laughs> Time to end this show. It's been uh, one of those days. Mommy and Daddy haven't done the show for a while, so we're a little <laughs> rusty. Um, uh, and yeah, they did reuse them, but I mean, barely. It was, uh, you, the refurbishment process on that was, is pretty expensive, mm -hmm. and you're essentially just refilling them with solid fuel again, and it's, you know, not that much cheaper to reuse them. At least the technology hadn't been born to make them that much cheaper to reuse them than to just mm -hmm. uh, build them new. But that's not to say that that technology couldn't be built. You know, prior to SpaceX landing rockets, uh, it was, it, there wasn't technology to ch cheaply and easily, or from a low cost way, reuse rockets either. Right. And you look at the space shuttle, and that's that's a example of exactly what not to do. So uh, you know, you you look at the space shuttle, and you look at building a new rocket. It costs you less to build a new rocket than to refurbish the the space plane. Mm -hmm. Let's just build a new rocket. So up until very very recently, we couldn't even do that with rockets. So it could be. I, I'm not going to say it can't be done. Uh, right. We just need someone to look at that industry and do it. Solids have specific use cases though, right? Uh, so it's not like if you just slam a solid motor on a vehicle that it's awesome. Uh, there are downsides to using solids. Um, as many people mentioned, you can't really easily shut them off. Uh, that's true. Um, but there are upsides to using solids as well. So, you know, I'm not sure this is something that we need to attack right now. I don't think any any of the space companies that are working on reusability are like, I need a reusable solid. Right. Uh, I mean, I know Virgin Galactic's working on their hybrid motor, but yeah. uh, that's, a different, that's a different thing entirely. So yeah. I'm not sure this is an actually an issue today. So then does that mean uh, in terms, and, and my, my knowledge on this is very basic, I'll admit that. So does that mean, so the difference between then hard hard uh, solid fuel rockets and mm -hmm. liquid fuel rockets. Hard, hard, Rocket that's versus not, soft okay, rocket. That's not entirely <laughs> off, though. <laughs> yeah, solid, solid fuel versus liquid. Yeah. Versus squishy fuel. Squ versus squishy right. fuel, yeah. Right. Huggle, the huggable Sloshy kind. Squishy fuel, squishy the fuel. The gentle giant fuel yeah. versus yeah, the yeah. intimidating. So, um, what's your question? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> You're uh, welcome. Okay. Uh, oh, no, yeah. Um, so in terms of liquids versus solids, um, I know that liquids are kind of right now the way of the future, if I'm not mistaken. Just based on the little reading I've done in terms of things like reusability or just sustainability, I mean, um, like what's the big hoo-hop there? They work very, very differently from yeah. one another, right? So uh, it kind of just depends on what it is that you need to do and how fast you need to do it. Okay. Um, if you're talking about throttle ability, it's not that you can't throttle solid rockets or solid fuel uh, rockets. You can, uh, what they say is they, uh, you bake it in into the mold, right? So mm -hmm. uh, think of as opposed to a taper candle, you have one of those candles that kind of Right, oh. and so you can different patterns will create different burns. Yeah. So you are either um, 
burning a whole lot at one time or are you burning a very little and you can kind of throttle it okay. in that sort of manner. The big deal is that as soon as you light a solid fuel, it, it lights and it goes and that's it. And there's none of this like blowing it out and stopping and then restarting and all that sort of fun stuff. Am I? No, that's right. Yep, so. right. But the so, thing with so the liquid is like if you use a little bit, you kind of go, oh, well, we didn't need to do that or we were just doing a static fire and we can either offload the liquid or put the liquid back on or any of those sorts of things. You have a little bit more flexibility in that kind of way. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Dada says, solids have a higher power density. Liquids are good to throttle and able to restart. Solid burns to depletion. Like, once you light it, that's it. You've lit it, and then you're done at that point. Uh, so it, 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 they are just slightly different things for different applications. It's not necessarily that one is better than the other, just depending on what you is you want to do. Does okay. that kind of help? Here, here's a really yeah. good way. The space shuttle on the launch pad, right? They would yeah. light the three space shuttle main engines. Those were mm -hmm. liquid engines, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Mm -hmm. Those engines would light, the th shuttle would bounce back and forth and sit there and kind of equal out, and then they would light the solids. Now keep in mind, they held the space shuttle down when they were on liquids, but the moment those solids light, there was, if, if they didn't let go, it doesn't matter, they're going to space. Like, the, <laughs> the solids would just rip right out of their enclosures and just push you off into space. Uh -huh. So there's, you're not holding a solid back. And yeah. the, uh, Orbital ATK has these, I'm sorry, Orbital ATK Space Division North of Grumman has these incredible video videos of these the new five-segment solid motors on their side, and they instantly light and uh, they basically just turn the ground to glass underneath them. They are intense. I still and want powerful. glass from that, by the way. Yeah, orbital ABT, Space Division, <laughs> North of Grumman. We would like, love you some can make SRB extra, like, glass. Trinkets mm -hmm. out of that. Like I want. That's what. Thank you. Exactly. Now I have my own camera. I want like a pendant or like a keychain. Like we have to be able to figure out some sort of way to make maybe like molds for like goblets and crap. Like goblets. I want SRB glass. Thank you. Keep going. No, no, I agree. I agree. No, that, that's basically, it. and uh, you know, where the other thing with solids is they instantly light, whereas liquids take a second to kind of spin up. Okay. So the moment you light a solid, it goes. So where solids make a ton of sense is launch abort systems. Right, because you need it to go. You need it to go now, yeah. and you don't need Emergency. you don't need to throttle. You don't need right. to do anything. You just need to not be there anymore. GTFO. GTFO. Got right. It. So solids are just like boosh, and off, off you go. Yeah. Peace Got out. It. All <laughs> right. Boosh. Okay. So they make a ton of sense in those situations. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the moment you want to like throttle down or like restart it, or technically you might be able to bake something like that in a where a little it, more graceful. You have to. I, I mean, that's well. that's kind of. I'm not sure you would actually be able to do that, but you might be okay. able to. But yeah, that's where. They're just not as good at those types of things. But they do serve purposes, right? You slam them on the side of a vehicle, you need to spend a lot of sp stuff up to space. Okay. Yeah, you can, yeah, you you can use can solids to send a lot of stuff up to fun, space. Do a lot of fun fact, there. the Space awesome. Shuttle had a, uh, I think an 11 point um, firing chain for each of the solid rocket boosters that were on the side of the Space Shuttle. The entire volume inside of that booster was up to pressure through 11, those 11 steps in three tenths of a second. So that entire, when, when, when the, the whole call, stack, when the computer says go, it goes through 11 steps and the entire stack, that whole solid rocket booster is up to pressure in three tenths of a second. And you don't need that much for a launch abort system. That was for the entire space shuttle, uh -huh. right? So anyhow, anyway, we're, we're diverging. They're, That's amazing. They're, so a lot of people in the space industry hate solids because you put humans on solids and solids shake a lot and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I am not anti-solid or anti-liquid or pro-solid or pro-liquid. I am pro use the thing that makes the most sense. Um, Anyhow, we diverged So, seriously. But, but the, the initial question was, uh, aren't SRBs, solid rocket boosters, notoriously hard to reuse economically? I mean, uh, I and mean, the answer is today they are, but so were rockets right. up until today, right? I mean, so uh, yes, but that's because no one has actually spent the time to make them reusable. Maybe you can't. Maybe you look at that and you just go, this doesn't make any sense. I could see that being the case, right? Sure. Or maybe because of the way it burns, you just cool and then you just put the goo back in it. Uh, see, mm, I mean building, I don't know, I don't know. I guess, I don't know. No, but no one spent the time to do it right. up until now. So there you go. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, right. thank you. No, I, I genuinely appreciate that because it's always <laughs> something that's kind of like, I, I try to like research a little and I'm just like, I don't really think I still understand, but that actually was very good explanations from both of you. Yay. So thanks, thanks mom More from her, yeah. Yeah, she was, she was yeah, on she was fire. On point. I mean, pun intended. Mm -hmm. um, pun? Are we pointing? 
This is awkward. <laughs> on camera boop for you folks live at home. <laughs> Doesn't get much better here tomorrow. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for all of your comments. Uh, again, if you would like to perhaps be featured in the show, go ahead and leave your comments on any of the channels that you are currently on right now, whether it's YouTube or Twitch or Facebook or all those fun things that kids are using these days, and we will um, perhaps use it in next week's show. But before we go, uh, we definitely want to recognize our ground support citizens. These people contribute a dollar an episode or a dollar a month. And again, every little bit helps. Um, you guys are the lifeblood of the show, <laughs> and we wouldn't be able to continue making these awesome shows <laughs> if it weren't for you. So, so oh you God. would like to be blood of the show. <laughs> if you would like to be a drop of blood in the body of tomorrow, um, a.k.a. become a citizen, this got weird, um, please head Just on over. Now. <laughs> we had this great show, and then mom and dad come on the show and derail the entire end of it. <laughs> to be fair, it really was your fault. It is beautiful. Um, but yeah, no, go ahead and head on over to, uh, to, to patreon.com slash TMRO. Again, if you'd like to be a part of us, a part of the show, if you'd like to join um, what we like to call this beautiful vessel called tomorrow. Hey, to be fair, we are an <laughs> awesome community. Mm, like, we are, we are. Like, yeah. This is Pretty just the best right. thing ever. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, right. Who do we have on next week? Oh, yes. So um, next week's show is going to be very exciting because next week's <laughs> show is going to be... Um, that's what happens when you lose your place, we unfortunately. We are absolutely going to have a wonderful guest named Frank Bunger. Sure, CEO yeah. of Orion Span, definitely a fascinating individual that we will have plenty of great questions for. And uh, we will also welcome questions from you um, on our chat. This is going to be an amazing after dark. It's yeah, it We're going to let you into a few secrets. By the way, uh, if you want to know where all of that just came from, definitely watch after dark. Totally. All right. <laughs> Take us out. We're done. Oh, yeah, we're done. Thank you. <laughs>